Hello, I'm Doug Lyon. I'm a media lecturer at Brighton University. Okay. Um, when I say happiness, what do you think of personally? Um, happiness for me is a surface quality, a surface emotion. It's very different to contentment or or joy or joyfulness. I think happiness is sort of surface to mid level things. It's sort of it's it's something that's dependent on events or circumstances around me at that moment in time whereas contentment's a much deeper thing that's like it's not like a smiley thing necessarily it's a sort of much deeper emotion okay um do you think memories can be can be used to improve your mood run that past me again do you think memories can be used to improve your mood? Like it's all right, Lovie, it's fine. Do I think memories can be used to improve happiness? To improve, yeah, just to improve your mood in general. Like if you're feeling like, bad or sad, like thinking about other memories, do you think it can make you feel better or do you think it makes you feel the same? Okay, um, memories connection between memories and happiness there's two things that I'd say one is in gestalt counseling have you ever heard of that it's a, it's a style of counseling called gestalt and for example that in gestalt counseling you can have all these little jars with lids on it and you take the lid off and you smell something and it's like coffee whiskey oh uncle john it's like you the link between something or an event is quite often remembered through all of your senses and sometimes you can trigger memories good or bad through re-triggering those senses which can be sight hearing smell touch taste um, <clears throat> and the new NLP lot neuro linguistic programming talk a lot about anchors so here's a, a little anchoring example so I, I don't know if this is a true story or not there's a lad there at a funeral and it's his parents funeral both of his parents have been killed in a car crash and he's at the funeral and his friend says to him I'll always be there for you and does this uh, gesture touches him on the shoulder ten years later he goes to a party Somebody goes, can I get you a drink? And he's instantly mortified on the spot. No idea why. Somebody's just offered him a drink. But they did this thing. And that, that anchor went in so deep at that point, which you forgot about. Why would you remember that? But it re-triggered that memory, which in this instance was an unhappy memory. But he doesn't, has no idea why he's unhappy. Somebody's just offered him a drink. So I think there's a whole nother layer of, I think we're all absolutely riddled with anchors like that and we have no idea why when somebody says, do you want a cup of tea, lovey, or something, that you, you, you're instantly happy or sad or something just because somebody said something. So I, I don't just think it's the link between memory and happiness. I think it's that our emotions are triggered by a whole series of anchors that have been set in our subconscious quite often at a very early age that we've absolutely no idea what they are and we're all triggered left right and centre in happy unhappy or neutral ways but the art of life is to be able to at least recognize ah I feel like that when somebody does that and and it's like being a detective and working it out and then if you can work it out what the NLP lot and I think the Gestalt lot say is if you recognise you've got an anchor, the only way to change it is you either dissolve it or replace it. So then you work at re-triggering that this gets attached to something else. So it overwrites that trigger of that particular memory. Or you work at dissolving it and make it go away. Well, that's, that's a whole other story, but I, I don't know what else to do with your question. <laughs> it, was, it was, can memories be used to improve your mood? Yeah, they can. So um, another NLP thing from neuro, neuro linguistic programming is 
they're very into you can create a state. So if I want to be playful and happy, then I go back in time to a time where I can remember feeling playful and happy. So I might have to go back to five or six or something like that. And if I can then put myself into my own body, in my memory, playful and happy. All right, OK, I was on the park, I was climbing trees, I was seven or eight. I had my mates around me, we were playing a bit of football, we didn't really care what we were doing, we were playful and happy. What did that look like? What did it smell like? What did it feel like? What did it taste like? If I can get those memories back into my body, I will have that experience of being playful and happy now. Like I can make it up, that emotion, by remembering those things. That's quite interesting. I mean, not many people try that, but it is amazing if you actually go through it. And we did this exercise where you imagine circles on the floor. And so you'd stand in a, an imaginary circle until you got, right, playful and happy. It was actually it was playful and curious. Or happy or tenacious, like not letting go of something. So you'd stand in the circle, your imaginary circle, until you'd got a memory that you could feel it, touch it, smell it, you're like, right, I've got it. And then you'd stand, and then you'd start hopping through these circles really quickly. Yeah, I am playful and curious. I am happy. And it's amazing. You can create that in your body. It's completely real. It's a bit of a fake it so you make it thing. But it's a real experience of having that emotion just through remembering but remembering it with all of your senses. Do you think happiness can be a choice? Or do you think that it, it's just, it just is sprung up? Do you think you can choose to be happy? Even yeah, I do, I do. And it's a bit of a contentious issue, this, because it blurs into health is a function of consciousness. Gets a bit tricky when you start saying, well, what about people who've got cancer? Have they made it up? Is it psychosomatic? That isn't what I'm saying. I do think that attitude, the way that you, the attitude with which you approach something affects your experience of that. So effectively you create your own reality by your own thoughts. Yeah, I do think that. Uh, do you feel memories have made you who you are? Like, so for example, if bad memories have happened, like... You know, have they what? Like, have made who you are. Oh, like, so yeah. Memories, like, it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger with happy memories, like... Um, do you feel it's made who you are now? Um, okay, there's different levels for this one. Do I think that I, who I am is made up of my memories? That is a question that I could take on a lot of different levels. Who I think I am is I've got personality. I've got what they would call in a lot of personal development circles a program. So you become the late person or the angry person or the spacey person or the wacky person or those kind of things tend to come out of, of our experiences when we're younger school, parents, media, friends, those kind of influences form a big part of who we are. Before we're seven, most of our character personality is formed before we're seven. And then most people endlessly live out that for the rest of their lives unless they decide to become more conscious about it. So, for example, my mum and dad split up when I was five. I went to three, separate infant schools in the space of a year in three different countries, Scotland, Wales and then England. And that was very formative for me. So I, I could say what I learned at that time of my life, around five or six, was that everybody that I get close to is suddenly taken away. Intimacy is always followed by abandonment or everything's just changed without me having any control over it. And I could say that I've lived a lot of my life around, I wouldn't really say it's a memory, but that those series of events was definitely very formative in my life and still are. Now, is that who I am? I don't think it is who I am. That's become part of a part of who I am, but that's not getting into spirit or soul. That's not getting into what the difference between your ego is and other aspects of your character 
I mean, that's complicated. You know, there's entire realms of psychology about the different aspects of who we are, or in, in philosophy and religion as well. But I do think on an everyday level, memories or formative events in our lives do quite often make a big part of who we are. But it is possible to reconfigure that, and that's why you have psychology and counselling and personal development. It's not written in stone. And you can do anything with anything. It's like you can be the lazy... I was a lazy late person, but what I did is I... I flicked it to the opposite so that then I could become a teacher who can ask other people not to be that because I've worked on it. Mm. So it's like people who've had a drug habit, if they can overcome that, then they become very useful to help other people because mm. they can say, look, I was you. I know what it's like to be like that. And if you just do this, you can be in a different place with it and that becomes useful. Um. When you look back over your life, would you change any of the bad memories for good memories? Uh, well, that's a really value-laden question, isn't it? Who decides what's good or bad? So, you know, somebody could win a million pounds. That seems like a good event. If what happens six months later is that that person no longer knows whether anybody likes them for who they really are and think all of their friends only like them because they've got money, then that willing a million pounds could turn into an unhappy event. I mean, it, there's just an event. Whether, you, whether it's good, bad or neutral, I do think is a choice. So I could say my parents splitting up at five was a bad event. Me going to three infant schools in the space of a year was very di disruptive and a bad event. But then when I look at what I've done with that in my life, I think, well, I am, I am by and large quite pleased with what I've done with it. So I, I think you can do anything with anything. You can turn being the poorest person in the world at the bottom of the pile into something very transformative, or you can become a victim. I mean, it's complicated, all this stuff, but... I come from the point of view that I can change seeing a bad event, seeing an event as a bad event and an unhappy thing in my life, I can change that in the now into something constructive or useful. Happy, I don't know. That's advanced. Um. What would you consider to be the main aspects of other people's happiness? So when you look at other people, what would you say most people find, find their happiness? Well, this is my 21st year of teaching. And when I ask people what they want, pretty much say the same things they want. Enough money, a job that they like, a home that they want to go home to, and a partner, maybe kids, family, social life thing. It seems to me that most people want very similar things of what they think is going to make them happy. My experience is whatever you think you want, when you get it, it lasts about two weeks before it wears off. And then you just want something else. So I think um, that's the difference between happiness and contentment. Happiness is a very fickle thing, comes and goes very easily. So, you know, you want a nice posh flash car, you save up your money or you do whatever you need to get it and you get in the car and drive around and then within probably a few weeks, you're probably thinking about something else. I think it's very fickle, happiness. Whereas contentment, if I was to die tomorrow, I would feel content that, for example, in my job, that I feel like I've helped a lot of people along the way to doing what they want to do in their life, whatever that might be for them. So I feel content about that, but it's not like I wake up in the morning feeling happy about it. But if I, if I ask myself, am I content with what I do in my professional life? Yeah, I am. Am I content with myself as a father? Yeah, I am. Uh, and that's a sort of more of a constant, deeper level. Am I happy with the way that I lead my life on a day-to-day -day basis? No, I'm not always, because there's always something to work on that's a bit of a drag. There seems to be always something, whatever I get 
in place, there's always something. But then, it, you know, people say, well, you can't have everything. So like, well, why can't you? And if you do have everything, whatever that is, maybe there's a whole other la layer that opens up. I mean, some people say you have to handle your survival stuff to be able to work on your spiritual development. So it's only at the point when you've got your bills paid and all that survival stuff handled that you can kind of do something else. As long as you're still chasing your tail to pay the rent or put food on the table, it's very distracting to a higher purpose, but maybe that's another story another time. Thank you.